Good morning. I'm Emily Hamilton. I'm one of the pastors here at CPC. We're so glad that you are joining us for worship this morning. So there's a picture. It's going to come up here. All right. This is a woman who's named Junko Tabe. And Tabe was Japanese. She was a wife and mother. She never grew past four foot nine, which is six inches shorter than me, for reference. She was labeled as a weak child growing up. She wasn't super athletic, but she fell in love with mountain climbing. And in 1975, she became the very first woman to ever summit Mount Everest. And after that, she inspired a generation of women and girls after her. And so between 1975 and today, over 670 women have gone and summited Mount Everest after her. I will never be one of them, but I still think there's something really powerful about seeing someone go first, especially when you share something in common with that person. Uh, it's powerful to see them go ahead. You know, for every human being on the planet, seeing Neil Armstrong take those first steps on the moon was mind-blowing. For African-American little boys in the 1940s who loved baseball, Jackie Robinson was a huge deal. For me, uh, the first time I saw a woman preach was really powerful because all of a sudden I was witnessing someone like me doing something that on my own I might not have been able to just imagine, but then I saw it. And all of a sudden I was like, maybe that could be me too. A different future started to break into the present where I was. And you begin to get a new imagination for what's possible when you see someone go ahead. Since Easter, we've been in this series called 40 Days That Changed the World, and today we get to day 40, which is the day that Jesus goes back up to heaven, and we call it the ascension. And after today, Jesus is no longer bodily present to his disciples. And so sometimes I think it's easy for us to think that Jesus kind of just like floats up, up, and away like a little bird, um, that somehow he becomes inaccessible to his friends. But a better way to think about it is, and the image that I want you to keep in your mind as we explore this story today is this. In the ascension, Jesus doesn't go away. He's not going away from us. Instead, he's going ahead. Like Junko Tabe and Neil Armstrong and Jackie Robinson, Jesus goes ahead of us in a human body like ours, paving the way, taking the first and final steps of the trajectory that we are all set on once we are in Christ. Death to sin and self and then victorious life everlasting in communion with God. And what's crazy is that when the first Christians realized this, when they realized that the ascended Jesus is a picture for them of their own future hope, that hope started to work its way backwards into their present. And it changed everything. As P.D. said last week, this, this newness begets newness. And the ascension of Jesus is a picture of God's future breaking into our present. So we're going to be in the book of Acts, which is at the, the book of Acts begins at the very end of Jesus' ministry on earth, uh, but when he was bodily present. So we're in Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 3. You can follow along on the screens. The story goes like this. After his suffering, Jesus presented himself to the disciples and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time gonna restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. 
And they were looking up intently into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So that's the story of the ascension. And every time in this church, when someone is baptized, we say together the words of this ancient creed called the Apostles' Creed. It's a statement of belief that rehearses the major moments of Jesus' life. And one of the things we say in the creed is we say we believe Jesus ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And for those of you grammar nerds like me, this is the only part of the creed that uses present tense, sits, which means that we believe right now, at this very moment, Jesus is bodily in heaven, sitting at the right hand of God. Jesus didn't dissolve into some kind of spiritual vapor when he ascended. His body exists right now. I think for most of us, it's kind of hard to get our minds around this. Like, why does this matter? Um, we kind of relate to the disciples here. We're like, yeah, like I would be looking up at the sky too, super confused. Like, what's going on? Why does this matter? What difference does it make to say that we believe Jesus sits at the right hand of God? To help us, I think we've got to pull back and we've got to look at the big story of the Bible, and especially how heaven and earth relate to each other in that story. So in the Bible, heaven and earth are like two parts of God's good creation. Heaven is God's space, and earth is human space. And because heaven is God's space, it's like the control room for earth, command central, and at the creation of the world, God made the first human beings, Adam and Eve, to be kind of this like hinge point between heaven and earth. They were called to bear God's image and to reflect his heavenly rule to the rest of creation. And they were called then to honor God in heaven as they cared for the earth. And so at the beginning, heaven and earth existed together in harmony. But then Adam and Eve rebelled. They rejected God. And this causes like cosmic levels of brokenness that we cannot undo on our own. Petey quoted Pastor Glenn Packiam last week who says, sin has created a fracture between human space and God's space. And that fracture now means that earth is a place of death and suffering and injustice and evil. And as humans, we now fail to rightly show the image of God in the world. But of course, God loves this earth, and he's not content to just let this fracture be. So all throughout the Old Testament, we get glimpses of God creating spaces again of overlap between heaven and earth so that he can maintain relationship with his people through the sacrificial system in Israel, through the temple. These were like pockets of heaven on earth where communion with God was possible and restored. And then when Jesus comes, this story of heaven and earth, like it picks up pace. Jesus starts saying things like, I'm the new temple. I'm the place where heaven and earth meet. I'm bringing the kingdom of heaven into the earth. But he does it in the most surprising way. You see, Jesus goes to the people and the places that were as far away from heaven as you could possibly imagine. He goes to people like the sick and the unclean and the ones with bad reputations. He goes to places like prostitutes' tables and graveyards and ultimately a Roman cross. And what we see is that Jesus is reuniting heaven and earth, but not first by pulling us up to where he is, but by going down to where we are, descending all the way to death. And then on the third day, God raises Jesus from the dead. 
His crucified and scarred body begins to literally breathe again, and it's a real body with blood and bones and a heartbeat and DNA and a metabolism just like yours and mine. And it's in his resurrected body now that Jesus ascends and sits on the right hand of God once and for all, healing the gap between heaven and earth in his own body. And so when the disciples began to realize that, they were like, wait a minute. Jesus isn't going away to heaven. He's going ahead of us to heaven, bearing a body like ours. It's like Jesus is going first, like a a lead mountain climber, showing us the way to the summit. And so a different future starts breaking into the present. And for the early church, the reality of Jesus' ascension helped them focus on this new future in a couple ways. So first, in the ascension, the church saw that Jesus is restoring our humanity. Jesus restores our humanity. So you can imagine like an artist that is painting a beautiful portrait of someone. And so the person comes to sit for the portrait, they paint it. And then unfortunately, the painting gets like coffee spilled all over it. And with all the staining, you can't even like make out what the painting was supposed to be at all. It's totally messed up. But the artist is like, you know what? I'm a really good artist, and I really love this painting. I'm confident I can restore this. I'm going to call the subject to come and sit for me again, and I'm going to repaint their portrait right here on the same canvas, and I'm going to recreate this work of beauty, the one that was my intent all along. This is what God is doing for us in Jesus when Christ ascends. He is putting the finishing touches on a restored portrait. God's original creative intent was for us to bear his image in the world, but the sin of Adam and Eve became like a hereditary disease that marred the image in all of us, and we need to be remade. And when Jesus takes on our fallen humanity and dies in it, is resurrected in it, ascends in it, and then sends his spirit so we can stay connected to it. These are like all the beautiful colors that God, the artist, is using to restore to us all our true humanity, remaking us into the image bearers that he originally made us to be from the beginning, shining with the glory of heaven here on earth. And so Jesus does it first, he goes ahead, And that works backwards to where we are. And when you know to look for this, you can find this logic at work all throughout the Bible. When Paul wants to encourage people in his churches to quit sinning and embrace a better way to be human, this is what he says. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Paul says you want to be loving Set your heart on the loving Christ who sits at the right hand of God for you. You want to be a peacemaker? Set your heart on Christ who has forever made peace between heaven and earth. You want to be humble? Set your heart on Jesus who was so humble that he took on your broken humanity and brought it back to the heart of the Father. Meditate on what Jesus has done in going ahead of you and you will start to catch glimpses of the restoration process happening to your own humanity. And so the future breaks into the present. Another important thing that the church saw in the ascension is that Jesus is the true ruler over all things. Jesus ascends to heaven not only as our Savior who humbly bears our humanity, but also as our Lord who has conquered death. The ascension is not Jesus going off on some heavenly vacation. It is his coronation. And at first, the disciples seem to like halfway get it. They're like, um, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Like kind of back to us? And their question gives away that they're still looking for a king that fits their own expectations, a king that might lead a military and take out his enemies. But of course, this is not the kind of king that Jesus is. Jesus is not a king who 
kills his enemies. Jesus is a king who dies for his enemies. Jesus is a king who leaves his throne to save the needy. And it's precisely because he is king this way, in humility, that Paul says in Philippians, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And so right from the very beginning of Acts, we see that Jesus is the true king over all things, especially in how he defies our expectations of what a king should even be. And so it's kind of impossible to overstate how big of a deal this becomes for the early church because Acts, the whole rest of this story of the early church, is really about how this group of new early Christians just repeatedly and painfully bump up against people and systems and rulers that would rival the claim of Christ's lordship in their lives. And in fact, the way the story's told, they face so much opposition from the outside and so much infighting from the inside that sometimes it looked like Jesus wasn't ruling at all. But when things seemed bleak and when evil seemed like it would win, the church would remember, Jesus reigns. We know who's sitting in the control room now. It's not an accident that when Stephen, who's the very first martyr of the church, is killed in Acts chapter 7, the thing he says right before he dies is this, I see heaven open and I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. It's in the moment of his greatest suffering and trial, one that frankly very few of us could even imagine. In that moment, it's the reality of Christ's present reign that empowers his witness. And so because if the Jesus who reigns is the same Jesus who was crucified and resurrected in flesh like yours and mine, then the church realized we don't have anything left to be afraid of. Fear of death isn't our king anymore. Caesar isn't our king. Jesus is our king. And our humanity is safeguarded with him in heaven, for as he was resurrected, so too will we be. And so the future was breaking into the present. And while the Roman Empire spread through the power of military might and exploitation, the kingdom of heaven spread by the spirit that empowered the church for witness. It's the very last thing Jesus says to his friends. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. If the ascension is all about God's future breaking into the present, then the response that we're called to is to witness to that future. Of course, the word witness here in Greek, it's, uh, in Greek it's the word martus, which is where we get our English word martyr from. And uh, witnessing to Jesus does not mean that we're gonna all be martyrs who die for our faith, but what it does mean and what becomes abundantly clear throughout the story of the early church is that our witness is often most powerful in our moments of weakness and suffering. And so as witnesses, we're not gonna be magically airlifted out of this broken world. We're gonna be like Jesus, who now sends us to the ends of the earth, just like the Father sent him. We're like a team of mountain climbers, tethered by the Spirit to our lead climber, Jesus, who has shown us that the way up first means the way down. And because we know that he didn't only go down, but he also came up again, and because we know that he now sits as the one who rules and restores all things, we can trust him on the descent. Because Jesus ascended, the church learned we can trust him on the descent. So what did that look like? New Testament scholar Kevin Rowe describes it like this. Very quickly, the early church learned to think that no city and no neighborhood was too lost to be there. No Roman official was too powerful to reach. No poor drunkard was beyond help. No abandoned child should be left to fend for itself. No sick and helpless person should suffer and die alone. The Christians should be present to the world's pain. 
should be attentive to its needs, should work energetically for the truth of the gospel and practice, and should expect God to bear fruit from such faithfulness. They counted on the sure and certain hope that no matter how things turned out, the power of God that was at work in raising Jesus from the dead was at work in their work. So think about that. Present to pain, attentive to need, working energetically for the gospel in practice, in the sure and certain hope that no matter what, God's power is at work. When I hear that, I think about a story that I read this week about our black brothers and sisters in Buffalo who are grieving racial violence, and especially how the churches are coming together and processing what this all means. And so on the one hand, what they're talking about is they know that Jesus is ultimately the one in charge. And so that frees them to fully name and lament and call out the wrong that has happened. This is what one pastor said. He said, it's not just about saying a prayer on Sunday morning, but the church is called to speak up for those that cannot speak. At the water cooler, at the football game, at our churches, at our PTA meetings. What he's saying is that to witness to the truth that Jesus restores and rules all things means that we will work for justice and name the places in our world that we long to see the kingdom of heaven break into our present pain. And yet, still, miraculously, frankly, our black brothers and sisters in Buffalo grieve with hope. Celestine Cheney, was 65 years old, and she was one of the people killed at Top Supermarket. And her funeral was this past Tuesday. And at the funeral, this is what her pastor said to those that had gathered to remember and mourn for her. He said, death, where is your sting? On May 14th, it looked like death won. But I wanna tell you today, death don't have the last word. On May 14th, that person might have believed he had the final word, but I want you to know God has the final word. That's what it looks like when God's future starts breaking into our present. God has the final word, not a cheap word, not a sentimental word, but a word that raises the dead, restores humanity, rules over all, and promises to come back and make all things new here on earth as it is in heaven in Buffalo, as it is in heaven, in Mariupol, as it is in heaven, on 38th and Chicago, as it is in heaven, in Uvalde, as it is in heaven. And so in sure and certain hope, we trust ourselves tethered to the one who has gone ahead, breaking open God's future of heaven on earth, and it's already started. It's here and it's happening now. I'm just gonna invite us to spend a few moments just in some silent reflection together, inviting the Holy Spirit to show us the places in our lives and in our world where we really need to remember that Jesus is the one who restores and Jesus is the one who is ruling all things. So I just invite you to take a few moments now and invite the Holy Spirit into that space with you. Jesus, we look to you. And hallelujah, you reign. And even so, we ache with all the places that we long to see your reign more fully 
and your restoration of our humanity more complete. Because you ascended, Lord, may you give us deep trust with you as we also make the decent first. Make us your witnesses as we see and pray that your kingdom would come here on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.